Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for being with us uh, today. It's such a joy to have with us uh, Radhana Swami. Uh, as you heard, just a few of uh, his extraordinary achievements. And uh, I think the question is, you know, why do you do what you do? And I think that's always a question uh, for each of us. Uh, why do we care about the other? What benefit does it give us? What benefit does it give others? And um, at the end of the day, what's the purpose? Ultimately, I think the purpose is seva, being of service to others. But Radhanath, maybe you can tell us uh, your goals and uh, uh, a little bit about yourself. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be together with you once again, James. It's really such a special blessing. Thank you very much. And thank you for all those who are with us today. Um, I was born in America, and I was a teenager in the 1960s. And I, I saw much unrest in, in certain ways, very similar to the type of unrest that America is experiencing today and there was there was questions um, especially inequality um, I, I became a part of the counterculture I became part of the civil rights movement and I, I really had a passion for these things I really wanted to make a difference because otherwise life seemed so shallow and meaningless unless we're really making a difference in other people's lives and in the condition of the world. And after some time, I came to a personal conclusion that unless I have something within myself to give, I, I'm, I'm doing very little. And I believe that that something within myself was spiritual. So I went on a spiritual quest. And at that time, another difficulty came because I saw and I experienced much hypocrisy in the name of religion. Um, in, in, in religion where we're taught to be humble, I, have, I, I saw arrogance. In religion that teaches to love, I saw hate. So I, I came to a conclusion that there must be something beautiful and common at the heart or the essence of all true spiritual paths. And I really wanted to find that. I didn't want to be a part of sectarianism. I didn't want to be a part of I'm better than you or my religion's better than yours. I really wanted to find the heart of it. And, and in the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament, I found that the first and great commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the next part is important because when that love is awakened from within us, then we will love our neighbor as ourself. Because when we know ourself, we'll be able to identify who our neighbor is. And I, I started to travel the world studying religion, philosophy, studying nature, trying to find meaning and purpose in my life and a spiritual connection, and you know, studying Judaism and Christianity, and I hitchhiked from London to India through the Middle East also. I studied Islam, and when I was in India, when I finally came after about six months of hitchhiking, I lived in Himalayas, and I studied various um, schools of Buddhism and Hinduism and yoga. And ultimately, I came to the path and the teacher that I decided to follow, Srila Prabhupada, and the, the bhakti path, the path of devotion, where we call upon the one supreme source of everything that exists, the father, the mother of every living being. We call Krishna. There are many names. And my goal and purpose is to find that love within my heart so I can share it with others. Because the testimony that I found in all great religious paths of, of 
actual love, actual enlightenment is compassion. Um, you know, Moses took his people into the wilderness out of, you know, and, and led them with compassion. And, and Lord Jesus, you know, he was willing to, um, to be crucified in his compassion for others, what to speak of all he did in his life. And Lord Buddha, he, um, he attained nirvana, enlightenment, but he took this bodhisattva vow that I'm not going to, I'm not going to enjoy this, this unlimited liberated condition beyond this world until every living being in this world can have it too. And, um, and, and Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatmana Sochatina Kangshatin Samasara Veshu Bhuteshu Madbhaktim Labhate Param that one who's actually spiritually enlightened is self-satisfied. And in that state of peace, um, we see every living being with equal vision. We, we want to be a friend and a well-wisher to uplift everyone. And you know, physical, spiritual, and emotional, you know, people are in need in all these ways. And according to our capacity, whether we have a lot or have a little, we, I really wanted to just do my best in being an instrument of compassion in this world. It's interesting, uh, you mentioned all these different uh, spiritual and religious leaders, and yet we look at, as an example, America, but we can look at the UK or other parts of the world, and we see people who will state that they're religious, yet they do everything which is the opposite. Uh, they don't care about the other. They don't uh, uh, offer unlimited compassion they offer compassion based on either you agree with them or uh, you do certain things that separate you from others. And maybe you could comment on that. How, how have we come so far from this position of just giving to another uh, to uh, now selfishly uh, use this as a separator from the other? We're, we're dealing with human nature, James. <laughs> uh, it's, it's always like this, that everything within creation um, could have a negative or positive effect according to the intention of who's engaging that facility. Um, if money is used with love and compassion, it can, it can heal the world. If money is used with greed and arrogance, it can destroy so much of the world. If, if knowledge is used with compassion and humility, then knowledge can enlighten us and enlighten others. But if knowledge is, is used as a tool to to serve our own egos or our own anger or our own hatred, then it, it will have an opposite effect. Um, technology is the same way. You know, right now we're using this incredible Zoom technology <laughs> and we're trying to enlighten people. But, you know, we could use the same technology and really try to degrade people, you know, for ulterior motives. And the same principle is there with religion. Religion is a science in its true form. It's a lifestyle. Uh, it's a philosophy that's meant to help us to understand beyond our body and mind, we have a spiritual identity. And that spiritual identity is pure and it's good. And it has the capacity for unconditional, unmotivated love. And the way to reach that and the expression once it's reached is, as you so beautifully explained, James, seva, um, service to others, compassion to others. And um, religion is a very, something that's very powerful and it can be used 
to have a very powerful destructive force, or it could be used for a most powerful healing and enlightening force, depending on our intention. It's interesting because if you think about it, <clears throat> the uh, reality is that, of course, I'm a scientist. Uh, the reality is that if you look at our evolution as a species, one of the things that gave us, if you will, the gift of um, abstract thinking, uh, the uh, idea of another individual, if you will, uh, thinking independently from us, uh, abstract language. Uh, this allowed us our cortex to enlarge, which is wonderful. Uh, and the interesting thing is that <clears throat> As a result, unlike other offspring, our offspring has to be cared for. They have to be nurtured. They have to uh, understand how we behave and they don't run off into the forest like other uh, uh, offspring. The thing about that is that we have this thing called the mirror neuron system. And as a result, it uh, allows our offspring to learn from us. And that can be good or that can be bad. The wonderful thing about that is that they can understand uh, how if they're suffering, if they're in pain, this person reaches out to them, nurtures them, uh, holds them, feeds them, and they grow. And uh, of course, what we get from that is that when they're suffering, we respond to that. And in fact, what's amazing is that when we care, uh, those areas in our brain associated with reward actually increase in metabolism, which makes us, of course, uh, feel better. And then as we evolved into hunter-gatherers, of course, in these small groups of 10 to 50, which was how we lived our lives until uh, six to 8,000 years ago, it was also critically important that we... Uh, if we saw an individual who was suffering or in need, we responded to them. And as a result, we nurtured them, cared for them. And, uh, and that way that it improved uh, their ability to function and to uh, provide whatever job it was that they were doing, which helped the group. Uh, of course, unfortunately, uh, once you get beyond a certain size, let's say over 100 to 150, it's quite hard to contain that because there are certain people who fall outside of that and who are not doing the job, if you will. And as a result, uh, interestingly enough, one of the things that happened is we created this narrative that outside of ourselves was uh, someone or something that would maintain control. And interestingly enough, even in the face of that, we still did not do what we're supposed to do, which is to uh, uh, care for another. Uh, so I just want to give a little backdrop as to where this came from. And in some ways where religion came from, which is to have this uh, entity, if you will, and this is if you believe what I'm saying, actually, uh, this entity, <laughs> Uh, that oversaw everything uh, and uh, gave us a purpose also because there are two things that happen in that situation. One is uh, this idea that uh, when you die, that's over. Everything is over. There's nothing left. Uh, obviously, uh, with um, um, karma, there is some other thing that extends beyond that, or if you're talking about heaven, something else that extends beyond that. Or if you're talking though also about purpose is that, you know, what you do in this life has an effect on what happens, you know, later in life. And so, you know, in some ways that's how I as a scientist look at this, but that being said, you know, I um, wish I had every answer because I don't that answer fits with sort of the narrative I'm saying and fits with uh, the backdrop. But that being said, uh, clearly I spend a lot of time with people like you and others who uh, sort of give this other 
uh, uh, perspective. Interestingly, as you were talking about sort of this negative behavior and these doing different things, let's talk about COVID-19 right now. And what are your thoughts on that in terms of how people are reacting, how one should react, uh, you know, this issue of masks, et cetera. Um, on a personal level, um, several people who are very close to me, um, um, one of my dear most friends and one of the most beloved spiritual teachers in the world. Um, his name is His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj. I've known him for so many years. And he, he lived with such compassion and his, his whole life was dedicated in the service of God and others. And just last week, um, he passed away due to the influence of COVID-19. And probably about 100 people I know personally have it. And of course, you know, the world, the more we make a spiritual connection, the more we feel all humanity as our personal family. And even deeper than that, we, we find all living beings, our personal family. And we, there's a beautiful text in Sanskrit which tells para dukkha dukhi that the actual quality of an enlightened person is another person's suffering becomes our suffering and another person's happiness becomes our happiness and you know that how we're actually having that experience is is really the gauge of how we're making spiritual progress so this COVID-19 is, is causing so much suffering. And, you know, we're caught, there's a great care that, that um, is there in, in, in our hearts. At the same time, it's an opportunity because the nature of society is we become so much entangled and distracted by superficial things. And we think they're so important. Um, this is an opportunity to take a step back and really evaluate what really is of value and meaning and purpose in my life. Um, and, and integrate that into everything we do. Um, we could love things, we, we can find some satisfaction in our mind and in our senses through interaction with things. But things cannot give satisfaction to the heart. It is only to love and to be loved that gives fulfillment to the heart. And real happiness is actually a thing of the heart. And to focus on, you know, where we can actually nourish love, love in our relationships with our family, our friends, and a love that's above all the superficial differences that inevitably come between us, you know, to actually focus on a higher principle of, of why we love each other, why we care for each other. And um, from a spiritual perspective, the origin of that love is God's supreme love for us. And you know, from, from my experience of studying saints throughout history of all different spiritual traditions and, and by my beloved Guru's example and by my own personal experiences, however small they may be, you know, that experience of God's love is something that's, that's more real than any of the ta apparent tangible things of this world. When we connect to it within our heart, it's the most tangible reality of our life. And to, to serve that love, and that's what's so much required in the world on every level. And this COVID-19, it's a tragedy, it's a crisis. I, I really believe, you know, 
from a from a physical, social, and emotional perspective, we should really take guidance from from the scientists and the doctors like you, Dr. Doty, <laughs> who actually understand the problem in a deeper way. But at the same time, um, the doors are open for us to go into deeper spiritual connection and experience. Speaking of that, you know, it's interesting. They ask a group of uh, students what they wanted to be when they grow up. And uh, unfortunately, none of them said they wanted to be uh, enlightened gurus or uh, uh, helping others be of service. Uh, sadly, what they said was they wanted to be influencers. And, uh, you know, it's sort of sad in some ways because you have people uh, who sort of promote this narrative of, I have this, I have that, this makes me happy. And uh, I think sadly, what they don't understand is the reason they have this emptiness, they keep trying to fill it with things. And mm -hmm. the things don't offer any nourishment. Uh, and they don't understand that there's a subset of people who believe that these things will give you happiness, will give you uh, a feeling of being okay within your own skin and they don't bring you anything. And it's interesting because these people though, they keep taking more and more. And the reason I bring this up is that uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, we look even at some of our politicians who, you know, keep wanting things. And the reality is that they're trying to fill up this emptiness that they have with these different things. And unfortunately, there's a subgroup of people who are beneath them who say, wow, they have this, they have that. If I only had this, that's going to make me happy, whether it's a big house, whether it's a big car, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, what they don't appreciate is what makes someone happy that gives meaning in life is actually uh, to be of service, to care for another, to reach out, to uh, to give, to make your own life uh, one in which you are uh, every day doing an action that benefits another. When you do this, this is something that sticks with you uh, essentially every day. You know, no matter how bad you feel, no matter how hard you've worked, you're still blessed because you've been able uh, to be of service uh, to another person versus just trying to feed yourself something uh, that offers no relevance and certainly no sustenance. It's, there's, there's an example of fire, that a, a fire is hungry for fuel, but however much fuel you put on the fire, it gets hungrier and hungrier. The fire doesn't say, yes, I've had enough, I'm happy. <laughs> the more the fuel it's put on fire, the hungrier and more fuel the fire needs. And selfish desire is like that. Um, as you said, James, so beautifully that we're all looking for love. That's what we're actually, that's what the heart longs for. That's what the soul longs for. And somehow we're distracted to try to find the happiness, the peace of love in things. And, you know, even the physical body of people are things, you know, love is something that's heart to heart. You know, we're trying to find it in things like, like accumulation of money or property or power or fame or sex or all these different things. But however much we get, the tendency is we need more because we're actually thirsting for something beyond all this. And when we, you know, through meditation, through prayer, through 
through through seva, through through compassionate living toward others, we actually connect with the love within our heart. And then, you know, however intellectual we may be, or 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 not, however wealthy we may be, or not, it it really doesn't matter what our color, what our race, what our religion, what our sex. Um, we are sacred children from the same source. We, we are, from a spiritual perspective, our souls are forever beautiful and such it ananda, full of love. And, you know, a love that's beyond birth and beyond death. And that's what actually, that's who we are and that's what we're looking for. And when we connect to that, then we, we want to integrate that in whatever we do. We may be doctors or lawyers or business, or we may be politicians, or we may be little swamis like me, but that's all details, what our particular roles are in society. What's important is that we're coming from a place of values, of character, which are built on um, respect, gratitude, and actual care for others through, you know, of, of awakening of the love that's within us. Speaking of that, what, uh, you know, as you've seen in the United States, and I think maybe elsewhere in the world, this uh, Black Lives Matter. And it's interesting because, of course, people say blue lives matter, all lives matter. But the thing they're missing there, of course, is that uh, Black Lives Matter in the sense that they're the ones who are uh, effectively uh, being destroyed uh, by policemen and others. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? And how would you tell people to respond to that, if you will? Well, I'm going to use an analogy that's just coming to my mind. We, we have these bodies <laughs> and every part of my body matters. My eyes, my nose, my lungs, my heart, my brain, my legs, every part of the body matters. But if a particular part of the body is wounded, then every part of the body is giving special attention and focus to heal that wound. So all lives do matter not only all humanity, but all living beings, you know, the, the animals and the birds, you know, wherever there's the, the living um, pursuit of, of, of pleasure in life, um, you know, the little ant is looking for pleasure. Um, I've, I've seen, you know, in dogs and cats, and I've seen in cows and goats, you know, how the mother loves their little children, maybe not with the same intellectual capacity we do, but with the same emotion and care. They'll give their life to protect their little young, young one. Um, so, you know, everyone matters, but, you know, the, the African-American people in this country, you know, you know, from the time of coming have been, in, have been inflicted upon with so many injustices and so much pain. And, you know, the, our brothers, our sisters, you know, Black Lives Matter. And I think that's something that really should be in the forefront and a focus because, you know, this, because there's a need. There's a great need. Well, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, I, they're very, the very basis of America is, is that everyone deserves life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness without consideration of their color or their race or their religion. And from a spiritual perspective, you know, we're all children of the same God. And, um, you know, when I was young, this was a, a prominent part of my whole life, you know, being in civil rights, because there, there is so much injustice and inequality, and it really does have to be addressed very seriously. And in that way, um, 
you know, we can try to heal the wounds that have been created and, and, and uplift our society as a whole. Well, you know, ultimately, hopefully that is uh, the goal. I think, uh, you know, it's certainly been challenging. And I think with our present uh, president, uh, it's made it even more of a challenge uh, whereby I think if we had someone else who, instead of promoting divisiveness, uh, promoted togetherness and uh, working together. Um, maybe you can tell us uh, about some of the projects you're doing um, uh, related to your eco village and what's going on there. And I know it's shut down at the moment, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, what's happening there. Um, <laughs> the same principle that we've been discussing, James, um, we are applying to our Covert Hunt Eco Village. Um, the basic um, purpose is to respect the sanctity of life and to honor the gifts of God in the form of nature and in the form of all living beings. Um, harmony is so important. The word yoga means to reunite, to be in union with, to be in harmony, to harmonize the body, the mind, to harmonize the body and mind with the heart, to harmonize the heart with our eternal soul, to harmonize all of our actions and words um, with other living beings and with nature. The, the reality is, and you can explain it from a scientific perspective, I'm explaining it from a more of a spiritual philosophical idea, but everything is connected and everything is, everything and everyone is interdependent. And the quality of a meaningful life is how we live in harmony with others. And that harmony is really the basis of compassion. If, okay. if, we, don't, if we don't care about the environment, we're not showing compassion to all living beings because everyone is totally dependent on the environment. Um, so at our Govardhan Eco Village, we have an animal sanctuary. We have many different ecological pr projects. And the purpose of these projects is to demonstrate to the thousands of villages that are around us how to improve their lives um, physically, economically, health-wise, emotionally, and also spiritually. And, um, and also, you know, through the process, many students and universities from all over the world and colleges are coming, you know, on retreats there. Um, we have examples of water harvesting and um, processing human waste or sewage into pure water that, that, that grows beautiful gardens, <laughs> um, transforming um, plastic into usable oil, um, trans organic farming, developing the topsoil um, in such a way that you know, crops really grow in a very healthy way. Um, there, are, there are many such programs. We have a yoga school we have an Ayurvedic medical school. Um, in this way, we're trying in our small way to demonstrate the principles, how, how there are ways, there are ways we can adopt to live in harmony with nature and live in harmony with each other. And what a beautiful quality of life that actually creates. It brings us closer to God naturally. Well, it's interesting you mentioned interdependence because I think that's really, uh, you know, the key here, not only interdependence uh, among each of us, but also interdependence among animals and uh, humans and all living beings. Um, 
So what is what is next for Radhana Swami? What are you going to? Uh... <laughs> What is Any, next for me? Yes, I'm just, I'm, here. I'm, just so, I'm just so happy in the present moment being with you, Dr. Doty. I, I have nothing else that I can aspire for at this moment. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of locked down in the place where I am. And um, there's just so many opportunities through the internet and through, I guess, we're on Zoom right now. <laughs> to actually connect with people. Um, but, um, my my yeah. spiritual practice, I, uh, early in the morning, I, I have my spiritual practice where I really try to connect with my own inner self and, and with Krishna, with God. And, and through the, the riches of, of peace that comes from that, I, for the rest of the day, I try to share. And I may not be traveling all over the place like I usually do, but just sitting in this room, you know, to reach so many people. And according to how things unfold, then we'll make our plans accordingly. Well, that, that's gonna be uh, interesting. You know, people ask me what I do each day and I say that uh, <clears throat> I'll sit up at the side of the bed and I'll think of, uh, and while I'm breathing, I'll think of joy and awe about being present in this world. And then I go through these um, 10 letters of the alphabet, uh, which are C through L, and which is uh, something that I created actually when I was asked to speak to my medical school uh, about trying to inspire these new doctors as to what uh, they were going to do and <clears throat> to give them something that was easy to remember. And what I did with that uh, was to go through these 10 letters, which in some ways actually was my own journey. And it was C for compassion for self and others, D for recognizing the dignity of every other person. Uh, e is practicing equanimity or this uh, evenness of temperament in the face of things <clears throat> that we wanted to achieve or uh, avoidance of things that uh, were painful to us. F was uh, forgiveness. And um, which, of course, is one of the things that's a challenge, right, is to, you know, how do you carry uh, forgiveness for others when you actually have this uh, angry feeling. And, you know, someone pointed out it's like um, drinking poison and somehow thinking it's going to affect the other person, and it never does. So, you know, f uh, being able to forgive people but not forget uh, G is having gratitude, this idea of of appreciating what you have. This is one of, I think, the challenges is that so often, you know, we'll think of what we don't have because we're always looking up at another versus looking down and saying, oh my God, I, I'm so blessed to have so much. And then H is humility, this idea that you're not above another person. You know, the way to connect with someone is to be eye to eye. Uh, I is having integrity and values. Uh, J is this concept of justice or this idea of our responsibility for caring for those who are vulnerable or the sense of fairness, if you will. Uh, K is kindness that has nothing to do with suffering per se. You're just being nice. And all of this is uh, uh, contained by love. And I think that's my own practice in terms of um, how I function every day. Thank you. Thank you for that. It was beautiful, really beautiful. What, um, <clears throat> you know, we've talked about COVID. We've talked about, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. What do you think, uh, you know, we have, as an example, we have Poland where we have a, you know, populist uh, individual who's uh, 
written on the uh, issues of anti-LGBT rights uh, and uh, a variety of other uh, populist movements. I think we had um, the UK Boris Johnson, although I think once he got COVID, he became much nicer, didn't he? Uh, uh, and then we have uh, our president. What are your thoughts on this idea of um, populism and uh, sort of the separation of others uh, versus uh, connection, caring, loving everyone. Um, it was Emerson who said, the reason there's so much chaos in this world is because human beings are disconnected from their own selves. And when we're actually connected with ourself, we feel our connection with all beings. And, you know, in the name of capitalism and communism and socialism and in the name of nationalism and in the name of, you know, religion and the name of race, so many things were divided. Um, we, it, it's a very superficial way of thinking and living. And it's, um, it, it's due to a disconnect from our own true self. And that's where spirituality um, can actually very much help, um, where we see that all of nature is our mother, mother nature. And all living beings, whatever their color, whatever their nationality or race, we're, we truly are in reality, we're brothers and sisters. And the more, the more we respect each other and are united uh, on that level of respect and compassion, the more there's happiness and there's peace in the world. Of course, justice is important where there is people who are um, inflicting harm upon others, um, but you know, we hate the disease, but we don't hate the person that's diseased. We see that the potential in everyone and we, we want to serve. The idea of seva is a very universal principle. What, uh, and it's interesting you bring that up because if you look at, uh, as an example, there's certainly a large number of religious organizations that, um, believe what you say. What's interesting is I have not seen, and maybe I'm missing something and maybe you can explain, these different groups coming together to hold hands in the face of the Black Lives Movement or even some of the COVID-19 as far as saying, uh, let's come together, uh, let's look at this from a scientific point of view. Do you know why that is, uh, you think? Well, because of social distancing, it's hard to hold hands these days. <laughs> well, we can be, that could be one. Can, but we can be heart to heart and hold hands in that way. And, and that's very much important, what you're speaking, that like-minded people who are really pursuing goodness and justness, gratitude and humility, and I'll put all these things together, it's seva it's, and it's love. Um, you know, it is important that, in, that we need each other. We need to be, you know, connected. There's um, one of us could do a little, but if we're united with so many others, we could do so much. And for that unity to be real in your beautiful, Alpha, alphabetic philosophy, um, you know, humility and gratitude and forgiveness, all of these qualities are sacred. And um, we need to learn how to cultivate those. And, and we need to live in such a way and provide the opportunities in such a way so our children and our grandchildren, they grow up understanding this is what's really important in life, not the quantity of what I have, but the quality of who I am and how I'm loving and, and making a positive difference in the world. 
Well, that's certainly, uh, you know, true. And that, that's the question is, you know, uh, how do you do that? And uh, what are the mechanisms of, uh, of making that happen? You know, <clears throat> I think that perhaps in some ways, uh, it can be as simple as this conversation, uh, you know, going out in the world and uh, uh, having an impact on people. It's always interesting. Um, you know, on the one hand, of course, I speak about science. Uh, but then on the other hand, you know, I talk about the power of love and connection. And <clears throat> I think it's important to think of it that way in the sense of, you know, while we do fall back on science and science is what has allowed us, if you will, to be here today. But that being said, at the end of the day, the most important thing is what's in your heart and uh, what you do uh, for others uh, and how you can connect with others. It's, it's in some ways, it's horrible to watch. I don't know if you've seen any of this QAnon stuff. Have you seen that at all? No. You're lucky. <laughs> uh, the, so there's this idea of, of QAnon, which is uh, the response uh, to science and to, uh, if you will, uh, normative states by having this group of people who say that there's actually a deep state in the United States, which is negatively influencing things. And uh, that's why we need to support Donald Trump, which is sort of a, a, a fascinating thing. I only bring that up to bring up the fact that whether it's here or elsewhere, you know, we have these group of people who grab on to these conspiracy theories and these other theories about why things are happening, which have nothing to do with really anything. And it's sort of a, a sad, sad thing to watch because these people are so lost that they want to grab on to anything except for the thing which of course uh, is truly the real thing, which is again, being of service, caring for others uh, and supporting others. Um, only light can dispel darkness and only love can dispel hate. And, you know, we need to find those people and we need to have our own practices in our life to cultivate coming into that light and finding that peace and finding that love within ourselves and, and, and among ourselves. And it's really important. And I, I see um, through my own interactions that there are many people who are coming together, small groups, large groups, with a common purpose of focusing on these higher values. And that's what will change the world. Each, each and every one of us can make a incredible, significant, positive difference in the world. It, because it's not judged by the quantity of, of what we're accomplishing. It's, it's, it's really about the quality of our character, our values, and our intentions. And each one of us just sitting at home, we could make a great change to the world if we just have these positive intentions. And of course, you know, activism, activism to bring light to the world, activism to bring compassion and love to the world through our examples individually and collectively is, is what's so very, very important. And oftentimes what happens is the, solu the solution to our to problems, those solutions become much bigger problems than the original problem. Unless we actually have, you know, knowledge of how to actually find that light. <laughs> that light that... Um, that uplifts people, that brings people together, and that you know brings us closer to God and each other. And that's 
That's the challenge of the world today. And each and every one of us, we can't just depend on politicians to solve the problems. Each and every one of us, you know, within our own lives can come closer to the incredible power of love that's within us. Well, I think that's actually an excellent point, uh, you know, to consider uh, stopping on is this idea of, well, politicians can do wonderful things. Uh, politicians also have uh, their own needs. And uh, I think if we look at science, if we look at individuals who are trying to promote a common narrative of working together to improve the lives of everyone versus improving my life and the other people uh, don't matter. I think those are really uh, the most critical uh, aspects of uh, how to move forward versus staying in the same place or uh, moving backward. And there you have it. We've solved the world's problem. <laughs> well, just, you know, we are, um, Dr. Doty, it's really beautiful because we're so different, yet we're so connected. <laughs> we're in very different places. We have very different occupations. We even have very different philosophies. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, but yet, you know, the two of us have found something so sacred and beautiful that we have in common, and all the other things actually become beautiful <laughs> when we discover what we really have in common, and is that we we really want to bring light to the world. No, and I think this idea of seva and being of service is really uh, what's most important is, uh, you know, how can we work together uh, to make the world uh, a little bit of a nicer place? And I think- uh, I, I remember in, in 1971, I was in a holy place in India called Brindavan. Um, and there's over 5,000 temples and I've, these simple villagers, but everyone loves Radha Krishna. It's, it's, it's a very sweet um, path of loving God and a connecting with God. So I met my guru there, Srila Prabhupada. And at this time, he had temples and followers all over the world. And I, I had just met him. I was just a little wandering seeker. And I was sitting on the floor and he was sitting on the floor and there was a few other people in the room and a journalist asked him a question. He said, are you the guru for the whole world? And when he was asked that question, he looked down and I saw, I saw great emotion in him and he was in that, situ in, in that pose for a few seconds. And then he looked up and there were tears in his eyes. And he said, no. He said, I am just the servant of everyone. That's all. And at that time I was thinking, I want him to be my teacher. <laughs> because, you know, it, it, we, we shouldn't be, seeking to be great, we should be seeking to serve. Because in that service is actual greatness. I think that's what uh, people forget sometimes, is that in that service, there is greatness within that. So thank you so much for being with me. Uh, it's a joy. We're almost out of time. Uh, um, so thank you. I'm sure our paths will cross uh, again in the near future, maybe through Zoom, but hopefully. Uh, ah. I really hope so. Usually it's around this time of the year that we always meet in California. Exactly. Although I keep promising to come to India. I haven't been there in three years now. So I guess it's probably time.
Please know, Dr. Doty, you have a, a loving family that's waiting for your arrival in India, and, and we're going to start preparing for your arrival at this moment. Okay. okay. Uh, I don't know what that's going to be. Maybe, maybe you can tell me whenever that will happen. <laughs> can you say again? I'm sorry. I said maybe you can tell me when that's going to happen. I, I don't know when it's going to be. Um, I, I pray that it comes soon. Yes, indeed, indeed. Okay, my friend, well, thank you so much. Always a joy uh, and such a pleasure. And I look forward to us spending time uh, again soon. Thank, thank you, James, and my love to your whole family and my deepest gratitude to everyone who is joining Dr. Doty and myself today. Yes, thank you, thank you everyone. Hare Krishna.